Since the founding of the colonies, almost 16,000 Americans have departed this life, not at the mercy of chance or natural causes, but subject to the will of the state. These are men and women who found themselves on America's death row. Men and women condemned to pay the ultimate price for their crimes, death. The history of capital punishment in America is a long and bizarre story. It started when the first colonists arrived in Virginia in 1607. Captain George Kendall was accused of being a spy for the Spanish. Fearful that if set free, Kendall would reveal the weak defenses of the English colony, the council executed him by firing squad. The first person executed by capital punishment in America. Dr. Daniel Lachance has studied in depth America's history of capital punishment. The history of capital punishment dates back from the founding of the first colonies, so Jamestown in 1607 and the Plymouth and Mass Bay colonies shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, in, in most of our historical knowledge about the death penalty comes from uh, colonial New England where you had better record keeping. And uh, what, what we found is, is that in, in some ways uh, capital punishment was similar to that as it was practiced in England uh, in that uh, you had public executions that drew large crowds. Um, you had execution for offenses that today we would be surprised to see anyone uh, even get a small jail sentence for, you know, everything from fornication uh, to pickpocketing um, was a capital offense uh, in the 18th and, and early 19th centuries. But what's most surprising is that during America's founding, the crowds witnessing executions were not judging the condemned, but identifying with them, with the struggle between good and evil in all of us. Today we think about people who are put to death as monsters. That's how the media constructs them. But in colonial New England, they were seen quite differently. They were seen as almost representatives of a sinful humanity that everyone in the community partook in. And so a lot of what you find in accounts of executions from colonial New England uh, is, is not what we would expect uh, today, a kind of horror at the crime that was committed, um, but, but a kind of identification with the condemned, a hopefulness for their redemption. Of course, the most notorious cases of colonial capital punishment gone awry were the Salem witch trials from 1692 to 93. During more than a year of terror and bloodshed, 19 women were hanged, accused of being witches. But the community was not identifying with the condemned in these executions, but participating in a kind of mass hysteria, an early stain on the history of capital punishment in America. When the United States of America was born out of the Revolutionary War, a debate arose over the use of the death penalty. There's a real sort of division amongst, um, amongst the so-called founding fathers about the death penalty. Some saw the death penalty as um, a relic of a monarchical past, so that the death penalty was tainted because it was used by kings um, to execute people unfairly. Um, it was a sign of their capricious power uh, that the republic was the opposite of. Um, others, however, saw the death penalty as being warranted even more so in a democracy than in a monarchy, because when one committed a crime in a democracy, one was not offending the sovereign, right, uh, or a king. One was, one was offending the people, right, because the people rule in a democracy. And so the gravity of the crime in some revolutionary era minds uh, expanded, it grew, uh, because one was, was now uh, uh, disobeying laws that had been democratically enacted, and so the punishment was thought to, 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 be, um, uh, to need to be more severe. Dr. Paul Lytton knows that this great ambiguity among the Founding Fathers 
made its way into the United States Constitution. We do know that the framers contemplated the death penalty when writing the Constitution uh, because the Fifth Amendment of the uh, Constitution says that uh, no one shall be deprived of uh, their life or liberty without due process of law. So by stating in the Fifth Amendment that no one can be deprived of life without due process of law, we know that the framers uh, obviously contemplated the death penalty. Some folks argue the answer is easy. It's fair to assume that the framers thought it was okay uh, for someone to be put to death as long as they were provided, as long as that person was provided due process. However, others argue that uh, it's an open question whether the death penalty is constitutional, precisely because right, the Eighth Amendment says there shall be no cruel and unusual punishment. Um, is the death penalty cruel and unusual? Right? Some argue it should be an open question. Judges should decide, is it cruel and unusual, and not simply ask, did the framers think it was cruel and unusual? And so some people argue that uh, it's an open question whether it's constitutional. We should decide for ourselves whether or not the death penalty is cruel and unusual. Needless to say, the death penalty remained the ultimate punishment in the U.S. So, as the years progressed, so too did the idea of execution as a public spectacle. In the 1800s, executions were an excuse for spectators to get drunk, rowdy, and ironically, commit crimes. In response, the states began to change their venues of execution. Michael Radelet is a professor of sociology at the University of Colorado. He has studied the spectacle aspect of execution. People thought that the death penalty was a deterrent, and therefore they wanted public executions. Uh, in many states, public executions occurred on Fridays, the same day that Jesus was said to have died on the cross. Schools were closed, parents brought their children, teachers brought their kids, and they would go down uh, downtown uh, in, a, in a given city to a public square, and there they'd have a long, long spectacle of public hanging. This thing, this could go on for two or three hours. Uh, sometimes there was a choir, sometimes there was a band. Uh, the man on the gallows, these were usually by hanging, uh, usually would give a, what was called an execution sermon, where the person would stand up on the gallows and denounce alcohol and women and whatever contributed to his crime. There's this feeling that these executions have become carnivals. Um, so you start to see elites worried that these crowds are potentially taking the wrong messages away, but also that these crowds could become, in some instances, sympathetic to the condemned and interrupt the ceremony, or if they were highly uh, um, upset by the crime, could uh, try to, 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 to administer their own kind of punishment against the condemned. Um, and so there's this fear of chaos and disorder um, that, is, that slowly emerges over the course of the early to mid 19th century that, a lot, that, that, that in essence makes the elite say, we can no longer trust uh, this crowd. And in fact, rather than maintaining order, these executions could actually be sowing disorder. And so we've got to do something about them. And the solution was, to put them inside the jail yard at first, but crowds would find a way. People would gather in droves around the gates of the jails. Children would climb up in trees and look over the walls to see the hanging. Uh, people would go up onto rooftops to try to get a glimpse of the, um, of, 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 of the event. Um, and so it's this cat and mouse game until finally these executions are put into the bowels of prisons. In the last uh, state to do that was Kentucky. Their last public execution in 1937, uh, there were about a thousand people who attended that execution. Indeed, executions moved from public places near where the crimes occurred to private interiors of state prisons. The officials administering the punishment were no longer local sheriffs, but nameless state agents carrying out the deed on behalf of the aggrieved. And thus, the modern American death row was born, a bleak, isolated place where criminals convicted of the worst crimes imaginable await their demise.
However, the manner in which the condemned would die would change as America progressed into the 20th century. The Iron Maiden, Stoning, Crucifixion, Quartering, Hanging, Buried Alive, Burned at the Stake, The Guillotine. These early and violent methods of execution still haunt the imagination. Though some were adopted by the new colonies, one prevailed as the most popular, hanging. In fact, well over 9,000 American criminals have been executed this way. A rope is tied to a gallows or a tree. Then a noose is placed around the guilty person's neck. The support is removed, leaving the criminal dangling from the end of the rope, strangling to death. For most of American history, the primary method of execution has been by hanging. Cheap, you needed no skills, uh, you would put the guy on a horse under a tree branch uh, and uh, swat the horse and the horse would take off leaving the guy behind. It turns out it's very difficult to hang people. If the drop is, is too short, the person strangles to death and that really grosses out the crowd. The guy is dangling for a half hour and because they're a public, oftentimes the person's family and friends were witnessing it. And we've got all sorts of examples where people from the crowd would rush up to the gallows, grab the guy on the ankles and pull him down uh, to put him out of his misery more quickly. Uh, or if the drop was too long, the person's head would fall off, which of course grossed everybody out too. So from the late 19th century till today, we have this um, really interesting pattern. Um, I call it dark opt optimism. Um, there's this, there's this adamant feeling amongst elites in the United States that we can perfect the technologies that we use to put people to death so that they won't feel any pain and so that their death will not appear to witnesses to be gruesome, to be violent, um, to be similar to the crimes uh, for which these people were being punished. That's always the challenge for people carrying out an execution, is that the violence that the state is, is, is administering against a person who's been sentenced to death cannot look like the violence of the criminal wrong or the crime that the person had done to put the, that in that position of being sentenced to death. You don't want to confuse the righteous violence of the state with the lawless violence of the criminal. A new technology showcased in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair would give the powers that be a new humane form of execution, electricity. In 1889, William Francis Kemmler grabbed his trusty hatchet and chopped his wife, Tilly Ziegler, to death. After a little more than a year on death row, on August 6, 1890, Kemmler became the first man in the world to be executed by electric chair. Sitting on the chair, head covered, Kemmler muttered, take it easy and do it properly. I'm in no hurry. But the event was far from flawless. After the first jolt, doctors mistakenly declared Kemmler dead, only to realize he was still alive and gave him another 2,000 volts, twice what he had before. The smell of cooked flesh and singed hair filled the execution room. Not exactly a stellar way to usher in the age of the electric chair. 56 years later, a young black man, Willie Francis, took part in the biggest botched electric chair execution the country would see. In 1945, Francis confessed to shooting a Cajun pharmacist, Andrew Thomas, an old employer. A speedy trial ensued and Francis was sentenced to death by the state of Louisiana. Despite the fact that he was underage, only 15 at the time of the murder. On May 3, 1946, Francis walked what he thought 
was his last mile to the Louisiana State Penitentiary's electric chair, Gruesome Gertie. But Gertie had been improperly set up by a drunk security guard and his inmate assistant. Francis screamed while the volts shot through his body. The switch was flipped off, and very much alive Willie Francis went to the infirmary. Though Francis appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, a five to four decision sent Francis back to the chair. On May 9th, 1947, after only a year and a half and one earlier failed execution, Willie Francis was successfully executed. But most inmates are electrocuted without a hitch. Of the over 4,000 electrocutions carried out in the U.S., less than 2% were botched. But the gruesome accounts of the few botched electrocutions were still enough to steer elites toward a new, more humane method of execution. If there's too much electricity or it's not done right, you have to give several jolts. Uh, there's worry that if the person was not dead after the first round of electricity, somebody would have to order a second or even a third round. The electric chair people who are, who, who are burnt or where it takes 20 to 25 minutes in repeated shocks to put them to death, smoke rising from their body, filling the execution chamber with a putrid smell. Um, you see a, in response to that, not a kind of, um, we can't get this right, we need to abandon the effort to make executions humane and not have them all together, but a kind of dark, optimistic feeling that we can develop something different that will have fewer problems. That something turned out to be the gas chamber, the use of a poisonous gas that causes the victim to suffocate to death. The first such execution took place in the 1920s. Born in China around 1895, Ji John was a roaring 20s gangster, part of a violent Chinese gang. In August 1921, in Mina, Nevada, Ji murdered Tom Chong Ki, a member of a rival gang. Ji was quickly apprehended and sentenced to die by Nevada's newly approved method of dispensing death lethal gas. Officials originally tried to pump gas straight into his cell, but it didn't work due to leakage. So on February 8, 1924, in this room at the Nevada State Prison, G. John became the first person in the United States to be executed by lethal gas in a chamber. But the crude chamber was poorly sealed and witnesses reported smelling the deadly gas. Nonetheless, after nine minutes, G. John, the cold-blooded gangster, was dead. But improvements had to be made to perfect the gas chamber. And between 1923 uh, and 1956, 13 states adopted the gas chamber. Uh, and uh, when, they, when they invented it, um, they were not things that you could go down to the Home Depot and buy. So there was a manufacturer in Denver that made boilers. Today we call them furnaces, but big industrial boilers to heat up buildings. And with a little revamping, they made these boilers uh, into, an, into a gas chamber. Lethal gas has been used to dispense justice to some 600 death row inmates. But being gassed is a horrific experience. First, the accused is strapped into an austere metal chair. Then, a pellet of potassium cyanide is dropped into a bucket of sulfuric acid. This reaction creates deadly hydrogen cyanide gas. The condemned can stay alive as long as they can hold their breath, but once they suck in that first taste, the gas eats away at their lungs until suffocation a hideous way to lose one's life. Then at the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, on December 7, 1982, Charles Brooks Jr. became the first man in the U.S. to be executed by lethal injection. Six years earlier, 
Brooks took a used car on a test drive with the lot's mechanic, David Gregory. Brooks then picked up his accomplice, Woody Ludre. The two callous criminals threw Gregory in the trunk and drove him to a nearby motel, where they bound him to a chair with coat hangers and gagged him with tape. History will never know which killer pulled the trigger, but Gregory was shot once in the face and died instantly. Police found the used car parked outside the motel and arrested Brooks and Ludre. Though both had been targeted for the death penalty, only Brooks received the ultimate punishment. On death row, Brooks converted to Islam and even fell in love. But nothing could keep him from being strapped on a gurney and rolled into the death chamber. Robert Keller has written over 70 true crime books. He describes what happened next. The execution team will be preparing behind the curtain. The prisoner will be brought in and strapped to the gurney by wrists and ankle restraints. A heart monitor will be attached to his chest and he'll then be wheeled into the actual chamber on the gurney and positioned in front of the viewing window. The execution team then inserts two intravenous tubes, one into each arm. The tubes actually run from there through an opening in the wall into another room where the executioner waits. So the, neither the spectators nor the prisoner will see the executioner. Once the tubes are inserted, the executioner flicks a switch and a saline solution begins to flow into the tubes. The curtains are then drawn back to allow the witnesses to view the execution. At this time, the condemned is allowed to make a final statement, which is usually recorded and will later normally be released to the media. The warden then gives a signal and the executioner releases the cocktail of lethal drugs into the IV tubes. And within two minutes after that, the prisoner is normally dead. But lethal injection, like every form of capital punishment, can go horribly wrong. On December 13, 2006, it took Angel Diaz more than 40 minutes to succumb to his injection and two doses to bring him down. It was later discovered that the needle had passed through his vein and into his arm's soft tissue. On September 15, 2009, Ramel Broom had his own terrifying experience. Executions via lethal injection can go terribly wrong. So several years ago in Ohio, uh, a man was brought into the execution chamber and they could not find a vein to start the IV line that was, that's necessary to administer the, the cocktail of drugs that puts someone to death. Um, and they tried uh, for two hours poking and prodding him in different parts of his body, trying to establish uh, access to his vein. Um, and, and, and they eventually gave up. And he was taken away from the execution chamber, brought back to his cell, and is still on death row with new appeals uh, as a result of his experience in the execution chamber. So the, 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 the historical trajectory uh, of, of, of execution technology has been to continuously strive to develop a pain-free civilized form of putting someone to death, um, but we have never been successful at doing that. Right? So 3% of all executions have been botched since 1890 when the electric chair was developed, uh, but in the last 40 years as uh, lethal injection has become the dominant mode of execution in the United States, we, we have an 8% rate of botched execution. So Americans have gotten worse over time at putting people to death even though we've become incre we, 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 we continuously insist that we can do it in a way that's painless and humane. In all, lethal injection has been used on more than 1,200 condemned Americans. Like the so-called evolution of execution technology, so too there is a progression of the types of crimes punishable by death. 
Today, there is really one crime that sends criminals to death row. First degree murder. But in the early days of the nation's history, murder wasn't the only crime that could send you to your death. In the 1600s, capital punishment could be dealt for such crimes as stealing grapes, killing chickens, and trading with Indians. Trivial reasons to meet your fate. In the United States, we've had not only death sentences, but also executions for all sorts of crimes, and really all sorts of crimes up through uh, the 20th century, up until about uh, 1970. Uh, people were sentenced to death and executed not only for murder, but for rape, for robbery, burglary, uh, train, uh, train robbery, horse theft uh, was a capital crime, perjury in a capital trial, kidnapping, uh, which especially uh, a number of laws were passed in the wake of the kidnap murder of the, of the baby of aviator Charles Lindbergh in 1931, uh, but um, just really scores of capital crimes. And the whole history in the United States and really worldwide has been a history of limiting the death penalty. This limiting can be traced back to one man, an Italian criminologist and philosopher, Caesar Beccaria. When the Constitution was written in the United States in the late 1700s, there was an Italian philosopher named Caesar Beccaria who had written a very influential manuscript uh, called On Crimes and Punishments. And it really is the birth of the anti-death penalty movement. Uh, Beccaria argued for restrictions of the most severe types of punishment, not only the death penalty, but also forms of torture. And he also argued that the only time that the punishment should be used is, was if uh, the person was so uncontrollable that if the person continued to live that she or he would be a danger to, uh, to other people. So uh, that manuscript influenced the founders of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It's probably most, uh, most visible in the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Beccaria's humanitarian text got the attention of Dr. Benjamin Rush, an original signer of the Declaration of Independence and founder of the Pennsylvania Prison Society. At the time, most states had mandatory death sentence for all homicides, but Pennsylvania restricted it by differentiating murder into first degree, second degree, and manslaughter, and the death penalty was only available for first degree murder. But there have been further restrictions uh, throughout the century, so that today, for homicide at least, which is the only capital offense, it's still less than 1% of all homicides result in a death sentence. The abolitionist movement gained momentum, and in 1846, Michigan was the first state to do away with the death penalty. Wisconsin and Rhode Island soon followed suit. However, with the Civil War in full swing, the abolition of slavery took center stage, and interest in repealing the death penalty waned. Today, the death sentence is still legal in 31 states, and the worst capital offense, state or federal, is still first-degree murder, the most heinous crime imaginable. Gradually, over the years, only the worst of the worst would be sitting in their dark, solitary death row cell. But though the powers that be had the best of intentions, when it came to the death penalty, disastrous problems lay just beneath the surface. Problems with who was really being sentenced to die. During the 20th century in the United States, we saw increasing restriction of executions. Uh, the, most, the year with the most executions was 1937, 1939, and both those years we had 199 executions in the United States. Uh, however, uh, there were concerns about how systematically it was applied. Are we really getting the worst of the worst? Um, one example is rape. Between 1930 and 1967, there were 455 people executed for rape. 
and 90% of those people, 405, were black men with white victims, so an obvious racial disparity. And overall, between 1930 and 1967, there were 3,857 people executed, and 54% were black. So there were a number of uh, appeals in the 1960s brought because of the obvious racial disparity. Uh, black people were getting executed for uh, what would be, today would be like a, a manslaughter, uh, homicides that, like a barroom brawl. Uh, white people, before they were executed, had to kill two or three people. Death row inmates and humanitarian organizations alike continued to push for equality in death penalty sentencing. Finally, in 1972, a landmark case, Furman v. Georgia, made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the case Furman v. Georgia, the claim before the court was that the death penalty was being applied in an arbitrary and capricious manner, meaning juries were not given criteria to use to decide who should get death and who should not get death. Rather, when someone was convicted of a capital crime, for example, murder, it was up to basically the jury to decide life or death, and the jury wasn't given any legal standards to use to decide life or death. And the death penalty wasn't being used all that much. And so what the uh, death row inmates argued in the case was that the death penalty was being applied arbitrarily and capriciously. We didn't know why some folks were getting the death penalty and some weren't, because there were no legal standards. And to bolster that claim, they showed, look, very, very few people, even among the pool of murderers and rapists, very few are getting the death penalty. And there's no explanation why some of us got it, and most of us did not. And in 1971, the Supreme Court actually rejected that claim, um, rejected that claim under the Due Process Clause, and said, no, uh, the arbitrary imposition of the death penalty does not violate the Constitution. But a year later, the court changed its mind and held that the Eighth Amendment does ban the arbitrary and capricious use of the death penalty. And so the court, therefore, struck down all death penalty statutes at the time, even though it was not taking the death penalty off the table for the states. So it was up to the states to decide. If they wanted to keep the death penalty, they had to come up with a way to level the playing field. Well, if the problem that the court uh, found in 1972 was that juries were given were, were unguided discretion, well, how can states respond? Well, if the problem was unguided discretion, either states could provide juries guidance, give them standards to use, or they could take away discretion and make the death penalty mandatory. And both of those avenues were taken by some of the states. So many states, like Georgia, decided to let juries decide life or death, but they gave juries standards. So they uh, gave juries, here are reasons to give the death penalty. If, say for example, there was torture involved, or the person had killed before, or the victim was a child or a police officer, and they gave juries uh, reasons to give life, uh, mitigating circumstances. Other states, like Louisiana and North Carolina, decided to take away all discretion uh, from the jury and just say, if you were convicted of the highest degree of murder, you get the death penalty. The Supreme Court weighed these two avenues in two important cases in 1976.